Thank you. Uh, thanks to Dr. McKinsey and Dr. Tricello for inviting me to give this talk. I have no disclosures. So when we think about type 1A endoleaks and the etiology, it's really related to something wrong with the proximal neck. These endoleaks can occur early, as early as the index procedure, and they can often occur late, even years beyond the initial uh, implantation. Again, it has typically something to do with the proximal seal zone that has compromised that seal. You can have a short aortic neck, a calcified aortic neck, thrombus aligning the neck. You can have a trapezoidal shape or angulation. All of these can create some type of compromise for that proximal seal leading to an either early or late uh, type 1A endoleak. We also know that over time, these aortic necks can dilate, and when they dilate, a type 1A can uh, develop, and with those grafts without active fixation, those grafts can actually drop down into the aneurysm sac. So what's the problem with the type 1A endoleak? Well, what happens is the sac becomes perfused again and pressurized, and ultimately, they can rupture. And in fact, the most common cause of rupture after EVAR is a type 1A endoleak, so these do need to be treated. Upon diagnosis, there are a couple different things you can do to try to elicit whether or not you have a type 1A endoleak. If you successfully treated this patient in the pulsatile sac, if you were able to feel a pulsatile sac in, in a thin patient, uh, be, goes away and then reappears, then you should have some suspicion that there's systemic pressure within that uh, sac. Duplex uh, is sensitive for endoleak, but not very specific. It's difficult, I think, to determine whether it's a type 2 or a type 1 or type 3. Really, I think axial imaging is the way to go uh, with CT or MR or uh, ideally diagnostic angiogram as well. What's important here is you really need to see the leak either traversing through the proximal seal zone or right at the distal aspect of that seal zone. If you, it, sometimes it can be difficult because there's a ton of contrast in the, in the sac and you have to really see it originate at, right at that distal uh, aspect of that seal zone. So you can see on the CT scan on the axial and the sagittal images, there's obviously a lot of contrast within the sac, but you can see that it originates right at the distal aspect of that seal zone, and that would be uh, something to cue you in that you have a type 1A endoleak here. The MR, you can see the same thing. You can see that posterior leak right at the uh, distal aspect of the seal. And on the angiogram here, you can see it's pretty obvious that uh, through the seal zone, you can see that there's a uh, type 1A endoleak. So the concept of treatment is basically to try to deal with the seal zone if possible. You've lost the proximal seal zone. You either need to reestablish the proximal seal zone or you need to recreate a new proximal seal zone. Ultimately, you can also fill the, fill the leak, and that can be done either in conjunction or instead of the uh, above uh, two. So when we're talking about reestablishing the proximal seal zone in the most basic concept, you basically have a situation where an EVAR was placed. It was not brought to the immediate inferenal position, and so you have uncovered aorta between the top of the, the, the endograft fabric and the renals. This is very easy to fix. You take an aortic cuff, you bring it to the renals. You just have to be wary of how long the aortic cuff is so that you don't jail the renals or jail the contralateral limb at the flow divider. In a more difficult situation where you still have a non-dilated neck, you have some type of neck challenge that you need to overcome, whether it's calcification, thrombus, trapezoidal, for whatever reason, you know, you have a device and fabric up to that inferenal space, but you still have a type 1A endoleak. And what you need to he do here is you need to optimize your graft apposition. So one of the really nice ways uh, we've done this uh, traditionally is to use a palma stent. We typically deliver this through a 16 French sheath, usually, usually loaded on a coda balloon. Uh, typically, we use a 4010 or a 5010. Uh, the palmas, you have to realize you want to bridge through that seal zone. It's okay to extend the palma stent above the renal visceral segment. The interstices are large enough so that you will maintain perfusion to your branch vessels. All you need to worry about is the distal aspect, which is to not jail the contralateral limb. And you can see in this patient, after the palma stent, that endoleak has now been resolved. We've been able to reappose that fabric to that and, and recreate that seal zone. More, interest, more uh, recently, we've been using endo anchoring and staples. Uh, what this does is it help, helps attach the endograft to the aorta and fix or reline that endograft to the aortic wall, recreating and reestablishing more apposition and more seal uh, and allowing for a resolution of a type 1A endoleak. This is a, uh, uh, a, uh, some pictures of a patient who developed a type 1A endoleak at one year. Uh, an aortic cuff was placed, and that did not resolve the endoleak. And then ultimately, by placing six endo anchors and kind of reapposing that endograft to the seal zone to the aorta, uh, the endoleak was resolved. In some situations now, you're talk we're talking about a uh, compromised neck, usually a dilated neck. It becomes quite unhealthy, and you can't reestablish the seal zone with a palmas or endo anchoring. Uh, endo so adjunctive measures are not going to work. And what you really need to do is just move to the healthier aorta. 
branch or fenestrated devices or ultimately parallel graphs, uh, this is the way to do it to get yourself into that healthy aorta and recreate a new uh, proximal seal zone. So you can see in this patient what we did, we did parallel grafting. For This was the M2S that you just saw on the last slide, and you can see we parallel grafted and uh, resolved that type 1A endoleak. I think it's important to recognize that suprarenal stents are not prohibitive. Uh, if there's a device that has a suprarenal stent, you can still typically get through the struts. You can see here there's a patient with a type 1A. Uh, we get through the struts into that right renal, and then uh, we cuffed up and uh, did a snorkel with the right renal, and you can see that resolves the type 1A. So we just needed more seal zone. We need to go up higher into healthier aorta in order to seal that, uh, that leak. Another thing to recognize is that perfection is not always needed. We as surgeons are, are, are perfectionists, I think, at baseline, and we always want to do uh, what's, what is uh, optimal, but remember the enemy of good is better. Sometimes you just want to go for the seal. You have to recognize that these patients often can be fra uh, frail and sick. Loss of a renal can often be tolerated. The celiac can uh, be covered almost in uh, most situations as long as there's a patent uh, GDA that provides collateral flow. So here's a patient that has a prior uh, device. You can see very tortuous aorta. The renal, right renal comes off at a bad angle. There's a stent in it already. In this situation, you try for a little bit. If you can't get it, you move on. The left renal's bigger anyway. The left kidney's better, and you'll be fine uh, moving forward and not having the patient on the table for extra several hours trying to get that right renal. If you can't recreate these, uh, the leak, or, or I'm sorry, the seal, or reestablish the seal, or if you want to do something in conjunction, you can fill the leak. That's typically done with embolization, coils, onyx, glue, and historically we use thrombin, but less so uh, uh, these days. The approach, if you're going to come through the proximal seal zone, can either be from the arm or from the groin with a reverse catheter. You can uh, directly access the sac with, via a translumbar or transcaval approach and then sneak up along that uh, seal zone and deposit your uh, embolization material there. The disadvantages is that A, it may not work. Even if it works, there still may be pressurization through that embolization material into the sac. And then sometimes, uh, as you can see uh, in some, uh, certainly some literature reports, you can have uh, uh, misdirected embolization material that can cause catastrophic complications. And here's a patient that has this uh, type 1A endoleak. You can see on the lateral left side with a catheter directed into that leak. You can see, obviously, uh, it fills. Uh, a bunch of coils were placed here, and you can see uh, on the completion arteriogram that it doesn't fill the leak anymore. So in conclusion, type, one, type 1A endoleaks do occur. Uh, I think uh, you, ideally you want to obtain the proximal seal either by reestablishing or recreating a, a new seal zone up above. There are multiple methods to accomplish this. Ultimately, you can also fill the leak uh, instead or uh, in addition to. Thank you.